There's a phrase that is found in four areas of the Bible that many people do not even understand what it means. So I'm going to really expound on that phrase that says, the first will be last and the last will be first. Matthew 19, 30, 20, 16, Mark 10, 31, and Luke 13, 30 all carry this phrase. And two of them, Mark, Matthew 19, 30 and Mark 10, 31, are actually about the same parable. They refer to the same thing. There are two different events represented. The parable of the vineyard is the first time the phrase, the first will be last and the last will be first, occurs in the Bible in Matthew 19, 29 to 30. And this parable begins and ends with the begins and ends with those words. Jesus had just told the disciples that it would be hard for a wealthy person to enter heaven in Matthew 19, 23 to 26. The Jews believed that the rich could gain God's favor and righteousness by giving money. But this surprised Peter and he responded, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? In Matthew 19, 27, Peter was asking, then how can I get to heaven if even the wealthy cannot get to heaven? So Jesus used a parable about a vineyard owner who hires some laborers in the morning to work in the vineyard. And throughout the day, he continues hiring others to work in the vineyard. He just keeps coming back to the, to the town square and pulling out more workers. And he offered them all the wage when he hired them. He offered them a specific wage and then at the end of the day he paid them all the wage that he offered them which was the same wage and jesus repeated the statement at the end the first will be last and the last will be first only backwards of how it started out it had it in a flip order in the beginning of that story and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my name's sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Matthew 19, 29 and 30. The earlier workers, the ones who were chosen first at the beginning of the day were incredibly angry about this situation because they were hired for a specific amount, amount that they agreed to, but when they saw those who had just come out an hour ago getting paid the same amount, they were very angry and they expressed their anger over how unfair that was. And Jesus said, Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own, or are you envious because I am generous? Matthew twenty fifteen to 16 is the other area and in the context of this part the phrase the first will be last and the last will be first does not mean one person gains more honor than another it means that while a person may be first in this life with honor or wealth that does not mean the same thing for god's kingdom salvation or eternal life is not earned by one status in this life Jesus uses the phrase again in the illustration about those who seek to gain his favor by telling him all the things they did for him in this life. They give the impression that they're religious people, that they're thought to be good people. And like many, they begin to say things like, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but yourselves be thrown out. And they will come from east and west, from north and south, and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. Jesus was talking to the Jewish religious leaders who thought that they were first in Israel due to positions that they held. They thought they would enter the kingdom first. They considered themselves to be privileged and honored by God. And the 
Jews were God's chosen people, they knew, in Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 7, and the religious leaders knew that, and they banked on the favor that would give them. They assumed that heaven was a guarantee for them because they were Jews by race. Paul says later in Romans 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So the gospel was given to the Jews first. Jesus ministered to them first during his ministry, and the apostles then preached the gospel to the Jews on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. The gospel was to be given to the Jews and then to the Gentiles or Greeks. Roman 9 shows that the promises were given to the Jews first and then also promised to the Gentiles. That is why Jesus told the religious leaders that yes, they were first in God's plan, but they will be last since they were rejecting him. And on judgment day, he will tell them that he never knew them. Jesus ended the parable by reversing the phrase, first will be last and last first. He says, some are last who will be first and some are first who will be last. But both make it clear that we do not gain heaven by who we are or what we have done in this life. It is strictly God's decision. The vineyard owner decides. Salvation or eternal life is not earned by one status in this life at all. Eternal life is for those who believe in Jesus. So anyone who goes to heaven from this earth experience is one who has repented of their sin, which means they have turned from a life of serving self, pleasing self. It doesn't even have to be blatant sin like drugs, alcoholism. It can be religion, faithfully serving religion, but no time or um, honor spent for Jesus. So in order for people to go to heaven, they have to acknowledge that they can no longer live for themselves on this earth. They turn and follow Jesus and commit themselves to him, fully to him in their lives. Not just Sunday, not just when there's Bible study, fully, 24-7, seven days a week. And many miss the meaning of the word believe in Jesus because they think, I believe in Jesus, so they therefore are going to heaven. But the Greek word for believe literally means to trust, to have faith in, to obey, and to depend on. So when Jesus says we are to believe, he is saying to trust and depend on him. And this commitment that he compares it to is a marriage covenant. That's the comparison. A great love for time, money, and your heart. If there's something you value more, and I've always heard it said, look at your schedule, look at your wallet, and you will see where your heart is. So if there's something greater than the time that you seek and pursue being with Jesus through your time, your money, and your heart, that will break the relationship. You cannot say you are in a covenant with Jesus Christ if there's something else that has your worship more than him. It is more than intellectual knowledge, which many feel somehow is okay. That's religion. It, it opposes God. Those who are first in this life will not obtain eternal life unless they believe in Jesus Christ, repent from their sin, and follow him in every way possible. Those who are poor and insignificant in this life can gain eternal life by faith and may have great reward in heaven for faithful service. But they had nothing this side of heaven. They were very poor. Jesus made the statement, many who are first will be last. Many who are last will be first in context of his encounter with the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, 16 through 30. This young man had come to Jesus and shared how good he was, that he was keeping the commandments, that he was, he felt a great follower of the faith. And when Jesus asked him to sell all that he had and give it to the poor and follow him, he turned and walked away. He showed that he truly had a greater priority than the kingdom. Jesus has promised the, those that would follow him a hundred times as much plus eternal life. 
And then he repeats again, but many who are la first will be last, many who are last will be first in verse 30. <laughs> Jesus told that man, now if you really want to inherit eternal life, you go, sell, give, come, and follow. But this rich young man went away sorrowful because he had great possession and he loved his possessions. Jesus is not really saying, if you go sell all of your possessions, you qualify for heaven. That is not at all what he was saying. He gave that qualification so that he could show this young man where his heart really lied. It was not a provision for people to automatically go to heaven. It was an illustration to let this young man see where his priority was. It was not Jesus. He did not really love God but he loved his riches and he was not willing to repent of coveting things in order to follow Jesus. So this man who seemed to be at first shown by Jesus to look like he was somebody who could be last because he was obedient, but he was not, he was the opposite and he would not repent either. When presented with a choice, he would not repent. And there are many in the church who are exactly the same as this young ruler. They know that they are respected, they are religious, they look the part of being religious and respected, they speak the part of being religious and respected, they seem very knowledgeable about the Bible, but many are actually self-righteous and they will end up last because all that they consider to be good about themselves makes them feel they deserve heaven. And I can't even tell you how many people tell me they're going to heaven because they are a good person. That entire group falls into this category that if you say you are going to heaven because you are a good person, you at this moment are not going to heaven. You are completely missing how to get there and that way of getting there does not exist. It angers God because if that were a way to heaven, the death of Jesus was for no reason and there is no chance God would allow that. So if you think there's anything good about you that would qualify you for blessing, heaven, anything from God, you are incredibly deceived and you do not know Jesus. This group falsely believes that God is pleased by their good works, but it's frightening and often clearly spoken of that when you look good before men, you are going to end up last in the kingdom of God because he hates that. When the young ruler had been unwilling to give up much, he wouldn't give up anything that day for Christ, nothing. He was offered um, the option, the disciples, they in turn gave up everything. They walked away from everything to follow Jesus. And as Christians, we need to know that our omnipresent God who sees the heart will reward accordingly. The disciples are an example of those who may be first. They happen to be poor, most of them or all of them, but their poverty was not what makes them first in heaven. The rich young ruler is an example of those who may be last. He happened to be rich, but his wealth was not what made him last. Eternal life does not just have to do with what, do with God who can save whoever he wants because it is up to him who ends up in heaven and who doesn't. It is about his goodness. And that is about no one being selected based on their personal merit. It is all based on the goodness of God and how that is responded to in this life. God's goodness provides grace, which is open to everyone. It excludes no one, but we can exclude ourselves by not allowing the word of God to transform us on the inside. So many will read the word, but they don't allow it to do the deep work. They read it, they know it, they still feel they're good based on, I'm a good person, I didn't murder anyone. But if the word isn't alive and active in us, corresponding with the Holy Spirit in us, and actually changing us into the likeness of Christ, we are not in him. We do not know him because the word is the bread. And if we don't, 
not only will we exclude ourselves, but by our attitude and what we believe, we will also teach wrong things and others will end up in false error as well. They will end up not knowing the truth and so many people feel that based on their behavior, attending church a certain amount of times or certain ritual behavior that's religious, they are completely, no one's contradicting them in their church community and telling them that they are lost because they believe it's totally about performance, what's expected. They think they have to become a regular member of church to even have a chance at heaven, but anything that's based on our conduct has nothing to do with getting to heaven. God does, doesn't love us because of who we are, because of what we do or don't do. He loves us because of who he is. First John 4 makes it very clear that it's God's character that caused him to love us, and he did that while we were his enemies still. Romans 5.10, and there is not one time that we have ever earned grace from God, not once. There is no way to do it. God loves without distinction. In Matthew 7, 13 to 14, it says, All are called, but many, in fact, like the Pharisees, are not chosen. And there's a few that are chosen who end up being chosen because they know the attitudes expected, named in the Sermon on the Mount, and they covet becoming like that. That is a priority for them to study the Sermon on the Mount and aspire to be transformed into that. But many don't. They would prefer religion. They want to have their own gauge of what is acceptable and what isn't. It's dumbfounding to watch the political landscape right now because there's many things that are being positioned as a, re a certain party or a certain sex or different things. There's a lot of arguments going on. But in the end, none of that's going to matter. It isn't going to matter because if we are truly, if we are in the family of God and we belong to Jesus Christ, we have given up all rights to have our own opinions, to have our own interpretation, to have our own priorities about any of that we have completely laid that all down and we will submit to god and he is very clear about his position on any of these things we have one choice we submit to god agree with god and end up with god for eternity or we think we can make our own decisions we can argue the rationale of however we feel this should go but in doing that, we are separating ourselves from Jesus because if we are with Jesus, we are one with him. We don't have an ability to be opposing him in any choice. Do we desire to be great in the sight of man or in the sight of God? Do we desire to be first in the sight of man or first in the sight of God? In the sight of man, it is determined how many we rule over by having those priorities. But in the sight of God, that is determined by how much we serve and are willing to actually sacrifice. That's what makes us great with him. Jesus did not teach that the way to get to heaven is to live a life of poverty in this world either. The Bible is clear that salvation is by grace through faith, not works. Poor works, rich works, nothing to do with it. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 is clear about that. It is not connected to anyone's financial status. Jesus did not teach an automatic reversal of roles in heaven. There is no law in heaven where the poor and oppressed are going to rule over the rich and powerful. The rich aren't always last in heaven and the poor aren't always first in heaven. Nor will believers who enjoy wealth and prestige on earth be required to be lowered in heaven. Earthly rank will not automatically translate into the opposite heavenly rank. It is not about that at all. Jesus saying that the last would be first and the first would be last may also have held a special meaning for Peter, who had just spoken of having left everything to follow Jesus Christ in Matthew 19, 27. Jesus may have discerned that Peter was bragging, that he was also 
falling into the category of thinking that I've done this, therefore I should get this. And he was in Jesus' eyes moving towards spiritual complacency because that's where that will end up. Just as a rich young ruler, but for a different reason. Peter was headed the same way when he asked that question. Jesus' response in verse 30 may have been an indirect warning to Peter to always find his sufficiency in Christ alone, not in any sacrifice that he felt he made. That warranted some kind of reward. After all, without love, even the greatest sacrifice is absolutely worthless to God. According to 1 Corinthians 13.3, you can give all the money in the world and say you're giving it to God, but if you do not qualify for heaven by repenting of your sin, laying down your rights to self, turning from sin, following Jesus, you're going to miss it, there is nothing you can do to make up for that. There are several ways in which the first will be last and the last will be first holds true. There are some who are first to follow Jesus in time, yet were not the first in the kingdom. Judas Iscariot is an example, one of the first disciples. He was honored to be the treasurer of the group. He held the money. He had a high position as the treasurer, yet his greed led him to losing it all, including the kingdom of heaven. Paul was the last of the apostles, yet the one who worked the hardest. He was beaten all the time. He was constantly imprisoned. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three. There are some who are first in privilege, yet are not first in the kingdom. There are some who are first in prestige and rank, yet might never enter the kingdom. They could be the the. I don't want to name a specific religious title, but they could be, head the largest de denomination of a Christian denomination even and miss heaven completely. Many pastors of large churches today actually show by their lifestyle and how um, they're not present because you cannot talk to them. You cannot get near them. Many of them actually carry quite an entourage of people with them to protect them, keep them separate from the lesser folk. They worship power, they worship fame, and they worship riches that come to them on this earth. And if by miraculous intervention of God, they are knocked off that horse and humbled, they will tell you exactly that, that they worshiped power, fame, and riches, and they are really grateful that God brought it to a halt so that they had a chance to look at themselves truthfully before they had to meet Jesus face to face and go to hell for eternity. They speak very little of or never about the message of the cross of Jesus Christ and the call to holy living expected from and demanded of his followers. So if you are in a church that is not continuously bringing before you the expectations from honoring the cross of Jesus Christ and the death of Jesus for us, if they aren't continuously setting those expectations and when telling you that you're saved, that you cannot return to a life of sin or self-service, if they are not telling you that, there is a major problem in what is being taught in that church. Because if people think they can be saved but not separate from their sin, they are being lied to. Jesus told the Pharisees that the sinners that they despised are being saved ahead of them. He says in Matthew 21, 31 to 32, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors who were a despised occupation in those days and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. I think of some that we see down walking in the homeless areas of our city because we serve with Breakthrough Ministries down in areas where there's encampments, uh, we call those tent cities, um, just areas where homeless will gather and kind of reside in different ways. But often we see a guy that is just walking amongst those people and he's carrying a thermos and he's pouring out either cups of coffee or water and then he walks back to his vehicle and fills it but he's going around serving the homeless with cups of water or coffee he gives them he's done i've seen him with both and then he'll sit and visit with them 
And I always am just fascinated by this person because I think there's nothing in this for him. Here's, he doesn't even know that anybody sees him. He doesn't look, he doesn't stand out. He just mingles among them and beats, meets their basic need of thirst. And I look at that person as one of the most impressive people that I watch because I think there's, he's not doing this for anything for himself because he, he's, he doesn't, he's not anywhere where he can be seen by anyone who's going to advance him in any way. But in my opinion, I am impressed with very few more than I'm impressed with him because it's a love for humanity that is second to none. Very few people love others to that degree, especially others that are not offering you anything decent, but they're laying there passed out from drugs or alcohol. They have no decent language. He is showing such compassion and love. I remember hearing about David Cho's church in South Korea. I've mentioned this to a few people where he had, it's, I don't remember how many members he claimed at that time, but at this time, that church claims 480,000 members. They have so many services going on to accommodate that, that it's just kind of continuous services. People walk for miles and miles to go to the church. And someone had interviewed him and they asked him, what is the secret to your success in church building? How in the world did you build this big church? And he just says, I pray, I obey. That's all he would say. I pray, I obey. Well, they didn't believe him. They thought there's more to it than this. There's no way that you build all this from that. And so he took him over to the platform where he would stand and preach from. And he lifted the skirt up of the platform and he said, that's why. And they looked under the platform and there was the whole under the platform was all women who were on their knees, on their faces, praying. And he said, they're the reason this church is the size it is. Those women are the real reason. And so I think about that kind of thing and I have learned to know and deeply respect those who are called to intercession. I have two of them in my small group of women, and I know how rare it is to find a true intercessor. And I know, I know the, I, do, I don't have that, but I also know how priceless that is. And I am thankful to have not just one, but two. And I always know we're going to be okay because we have not but one, but two. And they also guide direct. And I know that as a, as a general rule, because they stay in their office and recognize that that is what they're for, I never fear what man can do to me because I know all of heaven watches them and I'm going to be okay because they're watching me. So I just look at any ministry that's privileged to have and their own personal intercessors. That is the best thing you could ever have. Someone could give me a million dollars to buy them from me and I would not take it. There is no chance I would take it. Money is worth nothing. I, there's no money that could buy them. What Jesus is teaching in Matthew 19.30 is this. There will be many surprises in heaven. Heaven's value system is far different from the system here. And those who are esteemed and respected in this world, like that rich young ruler, are going to most likely be frowned upon by God. The opposite is also true. Those who are despised and rejected in this world, like many of the disciples, may in fact be first to be rewarded by God. So don't get caught up in the world's way of ranking human value because it's completely not even close to how God sees. Those who are first in the opinion of others or in their own opinion are going to learn on Judgment Day that they are last in God's opinion. 
Another example of this is found in Mark 12, 41 through 44, as Jesus watched them cast money into the treasury. They cast in out of their abundance, it said. They thought they had done more than the widow who put in two mites, more in the way man looks at things, but not in the way God looks at things. He looks at the sacrifice level of our giving. In 2 Corinthians 8 through 9, the Macedonians could not equal the Corinthians in dollar amount, but in sacrifice, they far surpassed them. And that is the reason our giving is based upon abundance and affluence and not a dollar amount. So if we have more and we give a certain percentage, which many people do, or people figure out how much I'm giving, God looks at, compared to your total, what are you giving? How much are you sacrificing? That's his language. The condition of a sinner's heart before God also matters. For God not only knows and sees the heart of man, but he also sees whether they belong to him or not. So again, somebody could give everything they have, but if they have not chosen to repent and surrender to Jesus, it won't even matter. God sees the hearts of people, and he also sees the way they service the possessions that have been given to them. So it all came from him. It's all going to be limited as to what transfers into heaven. But it is clear that the only thing that's going to go to heaven with us is what was given to the kingdom. What became, what came as an a sacrifice given to the kingdom for kingdom advancement is the only way to be rewarded for what you had here on earth. It all belongs to God, but very few realize that nothing belongs to us. So if by some chance you got afforded the privilege of having a lot of resources, but you see them as your resources, what you earned, what's entitled to you, you don't know anything about God's economy. God owes us nothing. If he allowed you to have a lot of resources and you don't dispense them according to what his kingdom will advance from, that's disobedience. The Lord doesn't even owe salvation to any of us. He owes nothing to us. He gave his life. He gave everything to us. No one is allowed to feel entitled to any of their possessions, that it's theirs. It is being stewarded just like your children. You are being, you will be judged on. Did you see it as something I can use to advance the kingdom of God? Am I training up my children to be warriors for the kingdom, to be ambassadors for the king? Or do I see them as mine? I'm going to make them great athletes so that we can have money. I'm going to make them a great musician so that everyone will be paying attention to us. If your motivation for your children, those you are responsible for, your employees in a ministry, those who are all serving you, is not to make them like Christ and that their possessions are used to advance the kingdom, you're robbing God and you will answer for that. And many people's children will not see heaven because their parents did not see it a priority to help them to understand that if they did not surrender to Jesus Christ, they would not go to heaven. All that we see as our personal possessions is going to be burned up at the end. It will be burned. It will be gone. Everything that we call, that's mine. Nobody gets to go to heaven and take their lake house and their cars that are in storage and their 401k, anything that we felt that's mine is going to stand against us on judgment day. Anyone who claims success here on earth and brags of big ministries, personal achievement in ministry or business, prosperity, acclaim, who feel that they will have great reward in heaven because they have so many salvations to their credit, 
They feel like I changed all these lives. I have made an impact on so many people. God is repulsed by that. They have no understanding of God and how that impacts him. He is repulsed by that. Their reward is gone because their claim to it was here. It will not be in heaven. If they even get there, they're going to need to repent to even get there. 95% good is still offensive to God. You need to be 100% surrendered to Jesus knowing that everything I've done doesn't matter. That I have Jesus, what I have done out of the overflow of that to serve the kingdom is a privilege. It is a love offering. It is nothing that I should be given credit for. Only Jesus deserves the credit. So if you're getting credit for any kind of anything here, that is offensive to God. There's nothing good in any of us. He's very clear over and over. If you don't think I'm being truthful, read your Bible. It's very clear. God says, these people worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They think that by their abundance of religious activity, somehow they can gain God's favor, but God sees through all of it and shows them that all their self-righteousness, he said, is filthy rags, very offensive to him. You don't even want to know how filthy rags translates out. It's even worse than that. They will be the last because they pretended that they love me when their hearts were far from me. It was manipulation. He, he is so offended by that, that if they don't repent, they won't even end up in heaven. Self-righteous people often seem to take note of everything they do for God. They calculate, they keep record of numbers, they're always scoring. I, I don't understand how people count salvations because I don't know how you can because you can count the number of people that prayed some prayer but you have no way to count the actual salvations that come from that because that is on them to then walk that out completely with Jesus there has to be a lot of work put into that there is no way that number can be counted by an altar call or a response to a prayer or a threat for, about going to hell. It's something that has to be walked out. And many who end up praying, thinking they're saved, think they're saved, but they're not. They did not walk out anything. It's incredibly deceptive to keep numbers like this. And then worse, they compete against the numbers of others. So then there's all this competition that this church has this many salvations in a year, that church did not. This church is doing a far better job. There is just all kinds of false calculations made about them. And then some little church is probably out in the streets doing amazing ministry, not counting anything. They're just faithfully serving. People are coming to Christ by their example. Nobody's counting. We need to be humble. We need to let Jesus do the counting. We need to stay about his business. He, he's, not, he's not asking us to count. Many speak like those who came first to the vineyard. They say in Matthew 20, 12, we have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. Did you not see our hard work? Did you not see our success? Didn't you see that we suffered and that we're exhausted from all the serving? We did so much for you. Look at our bank accounts. Look at how much we gave to the church. Look at the numbers of people we're gathering in the church. Look how much bigger we are than last year. Look how much bigger we are than this other ministry, this other poor ministry. Look how much bigger we are. Look at how much more successful we are. Look how many more numbers we have. Numbers say nothing but point to pride and self-righteousness. That's what numbers do. That's a self-righteous spirit. You can compare. There is absolutely not one thing that should be compared. There is no reason 
to be counting numbers like that. It's arrogant when you keep track of all that you do so that you can say to God and others, look at this. Of course we will be seen as good and going to heaven and honorable and receive a great reward. That's the psychology of self-righteousness. God hates it, it offends him. And it is the height of arrogance and pride to imagine that sinful people like us could do anything, anything at all that would force God to love us or accept us that is offensive to God. We underestimate our sinfulness and we sure don't understand the holiness of God. Those who are proud and are first and who do those things will be last. But the good news of this is that on the flip side, the last like that don't do this setting are setting themselves to possibly be first and that's why jesus said i say to you the tax collectors like matthew and the prostitutes these people who are last in society go into the kingdom of god before you religious leaders matthew 21 31 but at least they're honest about their spiritual state because they know they're depraved they know they have nothing to give god they're broken and humbled before God. They're willing to come as beggars before God because they know that without him, they have no chance. There's nothing in them that's good. They know who they are. They're wretched. So anyone who doesn't know that, who's under some illusion that they have something good to bring, the Bible is clear. They're self-righteous and they're religious and they offend God. God does not operate based on fairness he operates based on generosity and grace that jesus would give his life and die and pay for a sinner like me that is how god works for by grace not by works or not by our own efforts but grace we get god's unmerited free and amazing blessings to those of us who know we don't deserve it he lavishes that on us we know we don't deserve it. When people tell me I feel unworthy or I feel like I don't deserve something from God, I say, just agree with that. We don't. We deserve nothing from God. We deserve hell. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift from God. It is not pay because you did something for him. It is a gift not the result of work so that no one can boast. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. No one, not one person, is going to be able to stand before God on the day of judgment and say, I was a leader in my church. I worked at least 70 hours a week, any given week. I've given a million dollars over the course of my life. I even served in the children's ministry. I've kept the Ten Commandments, and I am certain that I have done better than most around me. That person will find out that they're last because they were never a believer in Jesus to begin with. They had no idea. They were completely the opposite of what he stands for. You never loved him. That's why he says, if you did, you would understand your depravity before him and that anything that looks like success came from him, not you. All of our self-righteousness is not because of love for him. Oftentimes, it is a tool for us to get things from him or to get honor, something we want from other people. And it's never going to be radical or seen as radical because it's always self-centered. It is fixated on self. It's always going to do just enough to satisfy what God demands just enough so that they don't have to give up more of their life, more of their money, more of their own passions. They're always going to figure out just enough. But the gospel is powerful exactly in this way. When you understand the gospel and you're not operating in performance or legalism or self-righteousness, it empowers radical worship. That's how you get it. So I hope that no one will assume that just because they've been in church their entire life, they read the Bible every year, they say their prayers every day, they put money in the offering every time it goes by, 
that it means they have a right before God because no one has a right before God in any effort he makes. God hates and does not excel, accept any self-righteous deeds. So if you have been churched your entire life, this is the question. Have you been born again and converted to someone who knows the only good in you comes from Jesus Christ? Have you fully repented, meaning you turned from serving self in every way to following Jesus, listening for his voice, and doing what he says with your life because you belong to him? You don't belong to yourself anymore. So if you still see yourself as belonging to yourself, you do not belong to Jesus. That's an easy litmus test. If you do your life according to what you want in your terms and not because of the guiding hand of God, you are not born again. I urge anyone who is deceived into that, thinking they have that option to be born again and live according to their own desires, whatever those are, even if they're good, you need to repent and humble yourself before God because it's the only way for you to be saved, just like anyone else. Jesus said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew 21, 31, children know they need something and they know enough to call for help. So unless you're willing to say, Jesus, help me, I cannot save myself, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. You will go lost. Lost leaves one option, and that is hell for eternity. And it begins with humility. The gospel is that Jesus came to die to save sinners because it means we must acknowledge that we can't save ourselves. And if you're willing to be like a child and accept your own total unworthiness of even being saved by Jesus to enter heaven and see yourself as how sinful you truly are in the eyes of God, then you are in a position to believe on Jesus and what he has done for you on the cross so that your debt is paid before God. Spending time with God and his living word, his gospel and his love will motivate you. Nothing else will. It doesn't matter how exhilarating the ministry is that you're involved in. It's the wrong motivation if it's not coming from the overflow of the love of God. We love him because he first loved us. And the only way we can live lives that are surrendered for the kingdom is when we understand his deep love for us. That's the only way we will grow by going deeper into the gospel. That's why if you're not in the word, I, I'm not sure how it's possible for you to grow. You will definitely go back to the world. We need to rejoice in the gospel and understand more of the gospel and pray for understanding as we read because it's a living book and it will light up everything if you ask the Holy Spirit to read with you. Then you can joyfully and freely give your life into his service. Always remember that Jesus has taught us this. There's going to be a lot of surprises in heaven. Heaven's value system is very different than the one here that man has put together. Those who are esteemed and respected in this world will likely be frowned upon by God in the end. The opposite is also true. Those who are despised and rejected in this world are very likely, possibly going to be in line for a reward. The gospel frees us from ourselves to be a living sacrifice. We don't have to worry about self. We gave it up. We live in Christ. So if you're tired of striving in your Christian life, you're weary, stressed, you need to come back to the gospel of the Bible. Sit at the feet of Jesus, worship him, know his great love for you, and then when that is full in you, you will overflow and then you know everything good that comes from us is from his amazing grace. So God, we ask you to shatter that lie of self-righteousness in all of us. Humble us so that we realize that we are spiritually bankrupt apart from Jesus Christ. Help us to repent and to humble ourselves and to look to Jesus and his finished work on the cross alone. Jesus paid it all and all to him we owe. 
Nothing in our hands we bring, simply to the cross we cling. And may there be many who are so broken and contrite over their sin, over their pride, that they feel they are elevated in some way by some performance or provision, that they would be so humbled over their sin, this arrogance, that they will repent and come back to Jesus to be saved. Protect us from legalism and self-righteousness. Help us to compete in generosity only. Fan the flame of gospel in our hearts so that we think only on the depth of your great love for sending your son Jesus to die for such unworthy, filthy, dead sinners as ourselves. Show us the magnitude of your love. Help us understand the height, the depth, the breadth, the length of your love for us in Christ Jesus and pour that love out in our hearts so that we can serve and bless all of those around us from that great love and bring us back to the cross in Jesus' name. Amen.